진정이를 전율케 했으면 좋겠어. 세계 국제 심판장에 끌어냈으면 좋겠어. 정치범 수용소. 그 나는 정치범 수용소에 사람들 가두고 있고 그리고 그 자라나는 그 어린 애들한테 공개 처형을 강제로 보게 함으로써 그 국가에 대한 그런 공포감을 조성해 가지고 그 국가를 유지한다는 그 자체가 난 범죄라고 생각하고 있어 그리고 할 얘기를 마음대로 못하고 하고 또 최소한의 그 이동의 자유도 보장해 주는 그런 나라 또 그렇게 만든 사람이 저를 그런 사람 범죄자가 아니면 과연 어떤 사람 범죄일까? Welcome back. Once again, voices from uh, North Korean defectors in an excerpt from the documentary Kim jong il On today's show, we're taking a close look behind North Korea's closed political and social doors. From Barcelona, I'm joined by North Korean advocate Alejandro Cardovenos, uh, who's also president of the Korean Friendship Association. Here with me in the studio is Scott Snyder, director of the Center for U.S.-Korea Policy at the Asia Foundation. Alejandro, we ran a couple of clips there of uh, North Korean defectors. Moving on from the, the specific politics to the conditions there, um, when you listen to these stories of the way conditions are well you've been to pyongyang of course when you see the conditions there um it seems that things are, are pretty bad you've got starvation there's stories of torture public executions the korean people don't seem to really be uh, in in a good shape here they don't seem to be served by their leadership and some of the stories coming out are quite horrific how are you able to explain those well first i will say 99 percent is all absolute propaganda i'm working with the democratic people's republic of korea since more than 20 years ago I am free to go everywhere around the country, so I have friends at all levels in the society. And uh, I can say that, of course, we had a terrible, terrible crisis uh, starting from 1995 until the year 2000, uh, where many people died. We had many problems of uh, hunger due to the limited uh, production of food and due to the disappearance of the socialist market, as well as the increase of the blockade from the US. But since year 2000, the economy is recovering very, very fast. I remember 1997, 1998, where all Pyongyang shops were empty, and I even had to take food from China to share with my colleagues in the ministries. Uh, but uh, after year 2000, the economy is recovering very fast. There is no more starvation, no more problems of food. So we can say that actually we expect to achieve in year 2012 the full self-sufficiency in the country. The pictures we see coming out of uh, Korea, North Korea, don't show that at all, though, Alejandro. It shows a pretty bad situation. Of course, you're a spokesman for the country, so naturally you have a vested interest in portraying it in a positive way. But uh, for those seeing the pictures and hearing the stories, it's very hard to, to believe uh, what you say. Well, you have a multi-million propaganda machinery that comes uh, out from U.S. We don't have a single cent. Even my positions are completely honorary. So, uh, to start, we cannot fight with such kind of propaganda documentaries. Uh, some of the images that you are seeing today are taken for back from 1996, 1997, and even many of them are not even taking North Korea, but in other Southeast Asian countries. So, it's all basically sensationalism and manipulation. And I bring every year more than 200 to 300 people from all kinds of backgrounds. I bring them uh, through the streets uh, of all villages, so from Kaesong to Wonsan to Hyangsan any place of the country and the people can witness by themselves and that's why our Korean Friendship Association founded in year 2000 now comes with more than 8,500 friends in all around the world the biggest branch being in the United States so the opinion of the people will change the more the truth is disclosed what do you uh, Scott th there's a situation now we're going to put this to Alejandro in a minute but what do you expect to be the, the fate of the two American journalists and how significant it is it in the political uh, war that's going on right now between the uh, the US and, and Korea and North yeah. Korea well this is a very serious situation uh, it is a matter of certainly a matter of concern to the US government to the American people uh, the past precedent has been that when the DPRK has held individuals uh, who have crossed into their country uh, at least Americans, that eventually th they have been uh, released uh, and allowed to go. It doesn't mean that they've been exonerated by the DPRK. Uh, and s on, on some occasions, high-level envoys have gone and brought them back. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, that past precedent will hold in this case as well. Alejandro, in this case of the, uh, the two journalists, of uh, Yuna and, uh, and, and, and Laura, I think it is, uh, what do you expect to happen to the two? They're being held and there's no you know, un sort of unspecified criminal charges. There are unspecified criminal charges, I should say, that they crossed into the country. Well, you say about unspecified. First, I will ask what will happen if you find two North Koreans trying to cross from the Mexican border into USA with cameras. So for sure, they will be questioned and they will 
uh, they will be treated as criminals. It's a crime to enter in a country legally, especially in a country like uh, USA, where we have no diplomatic relations and we are technically at a state of war. So obviously they will uh, be treated uh, uh, accordingly uh, to with good human treatment, like we have treated several spies from USA capture in the past. And uh, normally the things that will happen is that USA most probably will have again to sign an apology letter to the government of the DPRK like it did in the past. So uh, both in the capture of the US spy ship Pueblo and uh, during the intrusion of a US Army helicopter, uh, United States government has signed the only two letters of apologize to other government. So uh, maybe it has to do it a third time. We are not interested in these two people, but we are interested in stopping the US maneuvers and uh, propaganda and attacks towards the DPRK. We've got Mohammed on the line from Saudi Arabia. Mohammed, what would you like to ask? Yes, Riz. I'd like to ask Senor Alejandro that the two ideological socialist states like China and Cuba are now beginning to open up their economies, are changing. So when does Senor Alejandro think that North Korea will start to open up to the world and, and what kind of circumstances would dictate that? Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Yes, so uh, DPRK, of course, uh, at our level of policy, we plan to continue with a socialist country, also with a socialist economy, but our economy has to evolve. So we are trying to adapt to the reality of the circumstances, actual circumstances, and to deal with European and other countries around the world based on a marketing economy. So uh, obviously, we are trying to adapt our external economy and our trading to the reality of the world and the globalization, but without changing the internal policy, which is a socialist policy, a Juche idea policy, uh, that pretends to create an equal basic, an equality among all the population. So uh, our, our country is going to evolve, our system is going to evolve, but it's never going to copy any other political system or social system like China or Cuba. But we are going to follow our own system, and in any case, we are never going to introduce capitalist measures inside the country. Scott, you mentioned earlier uh, about uh, the, the, the one of the elements being the leadership uh, succession. Uh, and, and I wonder where you see things, how important it is for Kim Jong-il to leave a legacy. There's talk about his younger son being groomed, now in the National uh, uh, Defense Commission, uh, being appointed at, at a level where he might be groomed. How, how significant is that, and how could it change the relationship between the U.S. and North Korea? Well, I think it is the case that the DPRK leadership must be concerned about uh, succession, given the fact that Kim Jong-il has had these uh, recent health problems. Mm. I think that what we're seeing over the course of the past few weeks is the first uh, sign that has been visible to the outside that in fact the North Koreans are trying to prepare for some kind of succession process. And clearly for a regime like North Korea, uh, the objective is to keep it all in the family. So we have uh, apparently uh, a son who has been designated uh, as a potential successor. That's not really yet fully confirmed, uh, but it's a natural direction for uh, the current leadership to want to go. The young man who's, who's studied in Switzerland, who's had more experience of the outside world, you know, has enjoyed basketball and so on. Um, what, if assuming that that succession does take place, what prospects are there for a more engaging relationship or engaging uh, discussion, at least between the two countries? Mm. I, I think it's very hard to say. Uh, you know, this is an individual who is inside a system uh, that has uh, persisted. Uh, in part as a result of isolation. I think that somebody who has been inside and outside uh, knows well uh, what the sources of potential uh, power uh, would be in that context. If things have been going in a cycle, backwards and forwards, as far as many people see it, you know, with this, this uh, almost a chess game between uh, North Korea and the West, uh, looking for concessions, looking for, you know, the carrot and stick seems to be going backwards and forwards. Wh what other approach could be taken if this, if so far sanctions and the negotiations, the way they've been going, haven't worked. What other op what other options does the West have? Well, what we haven't yet seen, I think, is a combination of carrots and sticks that essentially uh, creates. Well, it blocks alternatives to negotiation, and it basically uh, brings everybody together uh, toward the objectives that all the parties have signed on to: denuclearization, normalization of relations economic development for North Korea and also in the region, the establishment of a permanent peace. Alejandro, we've got literally just 20 seconds to go. Um, just want to get your, your take on uh, Kim Jong-il's health. What, what can you tell us? 
Well, uh, the, the health of our great leader is excellent. I just come back from Pyongyang. I was talking to our president, our vice president of the Supreme People's Assembly. So they are working on a daily basis with our great leader, Kim Jong-il. Okay. His health is excellent. And indeed, he didn't have any problem or whatever mentioned operations uh, right. by the Western press. And I just uh, let me yeah. point out that I have yes, yes. Sorry, sir. I have to stop you there because we've reached a, a, a crunch point. But we will speak to you again, I hope. Uh, thank you as well for being with us, Scott. And thank you for watching. Remember, don't forget to send your thoughts and views on issues to rizadaljazeera.net. From me and the team, see you next time.